Hi, this is Mark Ray, and you're in tune to episode four of Northern Sulfuric Soul Boy. This book and album is now available in physical form from Bandcamp. For those of you who live in Manchester or nearby, we're going to have a launch party at the Carlton Club in Wally Range, kicking off at 8 p.m. on December the 9th in conjunction with Psychedelic Discotheque. Tickets are available now online through Skiddle. Picking up the story from episode three, it's 1987 in the northwest of England. I had experienced a taste of Manchester street life and having survived, felt a little more confident in my new surroundings. Hardheads in Newcastle would fight for fighting's sake. It seemed in my adopted home it was more about the hustle. Still, I had yet to experience the nightlife in Manchester other than an aborted trip to the Friday night bop at the student union. I think I lasted under five minutes as hundreds of Morrissey quiffs fopped about to the ubiquity of the Smiths. My first real excursion in the underground club scene would come later, over the Pennines, in Sheffield. Winston and Parrot and Graham Park introduced me to eclectic, beat-perfect live mixing through the sound system at the Lead Mill. It was here that I first heard house music in a club setting and met Ross Clark, who would end up being my first musical partner in crime. We reconvened back in Manchester at the Polytechnic and after very little deliberation decided to start a club night. Ross had a large social circle and I could bring my talc-covered records to the table. We opted for the Man Alive Club on Grosvenor Street and called the night Fever. The Man Alive was small, about 250 in capacity, based below street level with ceilings so low they would knock your hat off as you entered. The owner of the club was from St Lucia and used to run early evening Caribbean domino competitions for his friends. At 10 o'clock, the students would file in to find the dance floor filled with tables and pensioners in deep concentration. What? Mark Fizz and DJ Nipper had the weekends on lockdown, so we opted to promote a Wednesday night, meaning students would have to be our target audience, as no sensibly employed person would stay up till 2am midweek. I made our first promo flyer for the night using Letraset and a borrowed image from a Best of Parliament Funkadelic album. Tether off, we're gonna tether off the mother sucker. Tether off the sucker. Ross put the word out and I put a flyer under every single door at the numerous student halls of residence throughout the urban sprawl of South Manchester. There were thousands of doors and thousands of flyers, but nothing was going to get in the way of us getting our personal party started. On one of these monumental runs, I met a young man from Birmingham called Kevin Hyde. He quickly joined the crew as an MC and DJ. Kev, with his call to the dance floor to tell your neighbour, expanded our musical minds and schooled us in the ways of reggae and rare groove. Up until that time, I had tracked a lot of my old soul and jazz records after they had been used as samples. Kev took us that step further. He was from the Birmingham sound system scene and had tunes that were steeped in culture and perhaps more importantly, for what was to come, hadn't yet been sampled. As ever with budding DJs, we shared all the knowledge together, always with an eye on being the one who played a big tune first. Finding a copy after witnessing a fellow DJ run the dance with it was another thing though. I'm still after some to this day. Fortunately there must have been at least 40 or more record shops and stalls in Manchester to hunt them down in, most of them manned by crazed collectors. To put their grumpiness in context, imagine if iTunes blocked you from buying a song after assessing the contents of your computer before going on to suggest you weren't quite ready for something of this quality. Seriously, have you not even heard of James Brown? What about ramp? I'm not talking what you put your car on, I'm talking about proper rare groove, mate. Christ, I'm not selling you that. What you putting it next to? On Iron Maiden LP? What are you doing with that? Go on, get off it. Hey, 
Well, put grease on, that's worth 30 quid, that. Counterintuitive, it seems, but really, you are being drawn into a life of stall addiction and high prices. <coughs> Building a collection was like a bedsit based arms race. Just as sound systems would battle against each other, owning original pressings and import copies would all count in the respect stakes with other DJs. Of course, the girls on the dance floor really didn't care, and rightly so. In its extremity, collecting is a form of illness, but I never got drawn in that far. I just wanted the bombs for the dance floor, on any pressing, as long as it was loud. <laughs> Fever started to get a reputation as the place to go on a Wednesday night. While the seeds of house music's predominance were being planted at the Hacienda and the Thunderdome, we carried on playing across the board, mostly to students with the odd local nutter thrown in. The music was a fusion of go-go, hip-hop, soul classics and Chicago house. I avoided the Hacienda like the plague, only venturing down if they had the likes of Spoony G performing. It was a big, cold place, and mostly empty, with the ambience of a work do in a distribution warehouse. My personal favourite venue was the Russell, also known as the PSV Club, which was smack bang in the centre of Hume's 1960s housing project disaster. The Crescents dominated South Central Manchester's skyline and had ended up as squats come the 80s. They provided a free home for anyone who was prepared to live without heating, or in some cases water. Looking at that brutalist debacle of town planning on a rainy day from a smoke-filled bus on the parkway would even make the happiest person have a depressing Eastern European cinema moment. <laughs> The club itself was tucked away on the estate and may well be one of the most culturally unique venues the UK has ever seen. It held 1,500 people over two floors, the top floor playing lovers rock reggae, hosted by a Jamaican bus driver dressed as Rupert the Bear. Downstairs was Raga, hip-hop and house spun by Chris Crooks, a top percussionist and local music head. The club was rammed every Saturday night with 50% hard knock moss side gangsters, wannabes in their malls, and 50% home county's tough students, forming a combination that was bizarre yet worked perfectly. Occasionally it took an hour of queuing to get in, particularly if the bouncers had been macheted by roving gangs from Birmingham earlier in the night. Three hundred yards from the PSV, in another part of the Crescents, was an illegal blues party called The Kitchen. It arose when enterprising young men knocked three of the flats together and set up a sound system and makeshift red stripe bar. The nights would run till daybreak, and it was here I first saw people taking ecstasy. In fact, the first person I saw with eyes like saucers happened to be Bez from the Happy Mondays, sliding up the walls in the semi-darkness to an early techno soundtrack that defined The Kitchen. In general, I avoided these drugs, as they would get in the way of my scratch practice. I did, however, make an exception for weed, as it seemed to make my mixing sound better. At home, I may add. Getting stoned before playing to 300 people was not the best idea. I tried it once and spent most of the time with my back to the crowd, rummaging around the bottom of my record bag, looking for biscuits. Rich tea. I did try E once or twice, but crying on the lounge carpet on a Tuesday didn't suit me so I steered clear after that. <laughs> the first time I tried it was a Public Enemy concert. As the fleet of badge-encrusted MA1 jacketed fans descended on the Apollo, I carefully poured the contents of an ecstasy caplet into the caramel centre of a round trees Rolo and melted the chocolate top back on with a lighter. Most DJs and club goers of the time will tell the story of how their life was changed by the power of the uplifting music, enhanced by the wonder drug that made the white man dance. 
My experience was to witness the entire front row of the Apollo's theatre seating collapse. Just as the drug kicked in, a mass riot kicked off. Chuck D belted out Rebel without a pause, and I sharp escaped into the night and fell in love with a lamppost, my girlfriend of the time watching on before joining in. It was to be my first and only menage a trois. At least it would be a sensible one where no one felt left out. Brothers and sisters, I don't know what this world is coming to. Yes, the rhythm, the rebel. Meanwhile, our club night fever was bouncing along nicely at The Man Alive. Through its success, I was asked to DJ before the hip-hop concerts at the International 2, which was a 1,000 capacity club in Longsight, situated on the doorstep of an estate full to the brim with ne'er-do-wells. I was lucky to play alongside Big Daddy Kane's DJ, Mr C, who I recall didn't use the crossfader and preferred to scratch with the upfaders. Quite a rare technique. <laughs> I'm the big daddy I presided over the gigs for Boogie Down Productions. So you're a philosopher? As well as Public Enemy and Ice-T. Surprisingly, it was Ice-T who threw the best gig, his Hollywood sense of drama catching the crowd's imagination. DJ booth at the International 2 was housed in the middle of one of the serving sections of the bar, and the club owners, being tight, only paid me 30 quid a night. Although I was happy just to get a chance to watch these seminal gigs, I exacted my own retribution for the low wages by taking an empty record box to the venue. I would then proceed to fill the box to the brim with cans of breaker lager and anything else I could get my hands on when the bar staff weren't looking. Believe me, this crew were deserving of the petty crime. They kept a pack of Rottweilers in the cellar that never saw daylight. Collectively, they had the air of an Irish version of the Hell's Angels. Such big risk I took for such little lager. Most of the students who attended the International 2 hip-hop gigs would leave minus some item, a street tax having been applied courtesy of the locals outside the venue or in the toilets. Outside, they would take the students' tickets off them and then sell them back to them. Simple, effective business skills at work. In the toilets, it was more a watches, hats and shoes thing. Take them off. With many a student returning home in their socks, oblivious of the time. One Wednesday night at The Man Alive, I was approached by a girl who claimed that her brother was putting on events in Los Angeles with iced tea. She said she was planning to bring iced tea over for a big club night, which would be called Water the Bush, like the event in L.A., she asked if I'd like to be the DJ for the occasion. I agreed, of course, but not really believing it was true. Amazingly, it was. The problem was, Ice-T didn't show up. We still threw a massive party with a thousand people rocking the place. The local estate hoodlums turned up, as you would expect, and were refused entrance at the door. But with so many rich pickings on show, they used fire extinguishers to batter the back doors of the club in. Once inside, they were primed to kick off, but I diverted the energy by playing Clementari's Colo Co, a tune so good that it could have halted the Battle of Stalingrad. Now you know that Jug Stark is the biggest talk around, and all Jugs push a let loose and do a hang on. Guys, a serious thing. Follow me, man. Too busy dancing to Clement's anti drugs message, the estate gremlins forgot to get nasty and got on with the raving. Tactical DJing in full effect. You've been listening to episode four of Northern Sulfuric Soul Boy. The rest of these episodes are up online on SoundCloud here. You can also pick this up as a book and 10 inch rolled into one via Mark Ray Bandcamp. For those of you who live near Manchester, there will be a launch party on December the 9th at the Carlton Club in Wally Range. In conjunction with Psychedelic Disco Tech, I'm going to bring you a night of all of this book's history. I'll be doing an hour long talk followed by Busy B with the Street Soul for an hour, then Sefton with an hour of hip hop, and then Kenny Grogan and myself finishing off with an hour and a half of spinning house and rave classics. Sure gonna be good, you can get the tickets on Skiddle. Thank you all for your support. <laughs>